Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Hi. It's so wonderful to be here in space with you all. Um, I'm Jamie Galoon. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the director and co-founder of HowlRound Theatre Commons. I am a white woman with brown hair and glasses, and I'm wearing red lipstick. On behalf of the International Presenting Commons and HowlRound, I'm delighted to welcome you today to International Presenting Now, Collaborative Models, Practices, and Pathways Toward a Sustainable Future. A huge thank you to Susan Feldman and everyone here at St. Anne's for having us. <laughs> It's wonderful to be having this conversation about international work in a place with such a deep commitment to it. We are live streaming, as you will notice, on HowlRound TV. So a big hello to everyone tuning in. We're so happy that you're here. And as part of our live stream, we are offering live captions by the National Captioning Institute and providing ASL interpretation by Pro Bono ASL. So thank you to Selena and Travis. And a reminder that because of this, and for accessibility purposes, we are asking everyone today to use the mic when speaking, and that you be mindful of the pace of, of your speech, and that you begin with your name, pronouns, and a brief visual description, as I just modeled. So for those who are tuning in online, uh, we also invite you to use the chat function on HowlRound.com. We'll be looking at that uh, chat discussion, and when we open up into full group conversation, we'll be trying to bring some of your questions and comments um, into the room. So before we continue, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement. At HowlRound, we hold ourselves accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome our country's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. As part of this work, we must start by acknowledging that we are gathering today on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lenape elders past, present, and future, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we convene today. We encourage you to learn about and support Branch of Knowledge, led by R River Whittle, Caddo and Lenape, and Catalyst Dance. Branch of Knowledge is dedicated to acting as a bridge between Lenape people, resources, community, and land here on Lenape Hoking. Many ally organizations and Lenape people are working together in active decolonizing practice. Additionally, Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show has created this digital land acknowledgement that I'd like to share. Since our discussion today is shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art that we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country, as well as our shared responsibility to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. Thank you. Before we continue, I want to say a few words about HowlRound for those who may be unfamiliar. So HowlRound is a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide. We amplify progressive and disruptive ideas about theater and connect diverse practitioners. We envision a theater field where power and resources are shared equitably in all directions, contributing to a more just and sustainable world. We have an online journal where artists share their thinking, a live streaming television network, which you're witnessing right now. Um, and we also partner with the Latinx Theater Commons to advance the state of Latinx theater in the US. We're proud to co-manage the National Playwright Residency Program with the Mellon Foundation. And finally, we incubate collective action and organize in-person convenings like this one around urgent issues facing the field. We do all of this based in the Office of the Arts at Emerson College in Boston, alongside Arts Emerson, who are our partners in this work. It has been a great pleasure for HowlRound to advance our core value of global citizenship through working with the International Presenting Commons, organizing over the past 
32 months virtually until we met in person last night. Um, and it gives me great, great joy to introduce uh, the co-champions of this event who are part of a large, um, incredibly dedicated steering committee who are listed in your programming um, that make up the IPC. So I'm gonna pass it over to David House and Colleen Jennings Rogensack and acknowledge that Olga Gray English, who is also co-champion, sends her regrets from Los Angeles where unfortunately she's recovering from COVID. Olga, we know you are watching and we wish you a speedy recovery. David, over to you. Thank you, Jamie. I just, yes, please. I was gonna invite us to give, oh, this is a really lovely mic, um, uh, a hand for the incredible team at HowlRound who have kept us together over these 32 years. They do this work with intention, with commitment, and they keep driving us forward. So thank you to Jamie and Abigail and many others who are in, responsible there. I am David House. I am the Vice President of the Office of the Arts at Emerson College and the Executive Director at Arts Emerson in Boston. I am a black man with brown skin, with um, round silver glasses, and I'm wearing a navy, what, whatever, jacket with um, checks on it. Um, so it's wonderful to be here with you um, today. I'm gonna give us a little sense of, um, of how we arrived here. As Jamie mentioned, we had been gathering for 32 months. Um, in May of 2020, HowlRound began gathering a small ad hoc group of US-based presenters to discuss challenges facing international work. In January of 2021, we put on a session at ISPA, APAP, and Under the Radar Symposium. And in March of 2021, we host an event about the history of presenting. And in June of 2021, in partnership with Global Pillow, the IPC put on a global conven digital convening called Festivals for a New Age, Models of Responsiveness, Flexibility, and Resistance. So as you can hear, we have been busy. It has not been a linear path, but we've stayed together in this incredible journey, and we're thrilled to continue this journey today together in person. So over the past year plus, the group has continued to wrestle with the steep challenges of this moment while aiming to reimagine re international presenting for a new age. And as Jamie mentioned last night, for the first time, we were all together after those 32 months um, and um, countless hours on Zoom, I should add, and to celebrate each other, to celebrate the journey, and then to prepare for today. So um, last night was the first in-person meeting, and today we will look ahead exploring inspiring new pathways for sustaining and furthering global exchange and international touring in the United States. Since first coming together, IPC has grown smartly to include creative producers and has self-defined itself as an emergent, evolving volunteer group of US-based performing arts presenters and creative independent producers who have joined forces to keep international culture exchange and engagement alive and vibrant now and into the future. We've mentioned this august group of people who've been gathering for the 32 months, and I just wanna take a moment to recognize um, those members of the steering committee who are here with us um, today. So if you can just raise your hand so we can all see you and be proud and raise them high. Yes. Many are here today. There are many who are not um, able to be here um, with us uh, physically, but in, here in spirit. Many have been with us for 32 months. People have come in and out as our lives have adjusted to um, the moment they were in, but it's been a wonderful um, journey that we've been on together. IC IPC does this work through advocacy, active learning, resource sharing, and collaboration amongst these arts presenters, the producers that we mentioned, as well as uh, funders um, and artists. Um, we're doing the work to build a more sustainable policies and funding models for the exchange of work around the world. Our mission is in service of our increasingly diverse communities throughout the country. IPC celebrates its role as part of a global cultural ecosystem and by partnering with artists and presenters from all over the world. We do our work through a commons-based approach and we're currently organizing with the incredible support and thought partnership of HowlRound. And now I'd love to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, um, Colleen, who needs no introduction, to offer a few remarks. Thank you, David. I'm Colleen Jennings Rogensack, Vice President of Cultural Affairs at Arizona State University and Executive Director of ASU Gamage. I am a black woman wearing a black beret, and thanks to Susan Feldman, standing in St. Anne's Warehouse. 
The genesis of this event is rooted in our desire to bring together artists, presenters, creative producers, and funders to uplift innovative models and explore new collaborative practices that emerged during COVID and that can contribute to building a sustainable and robust ecosystem for the presentation of international work in the United States and to develop resources to support US artists, writ large, IPC is premised on the belief that global live art exchange remains essential to the world, in particular to the cultural health of the United States as a wide, whole, and diverse individual communities that presenters and artists serve across our country. We have intentionally structured today's convening as a conversation circle, as you see in front of us, and a listening circle of which we are all a part of. We chose this format because we wanted this to be an evolving conversation that could invite participation from many people rather than a formal panel. We'll begin by hearing from the conversation circle and then opening it up from contributions from the listening circle. We ask everyone to practice active listening and consider what perspectives you have to add. This is not the only conversation. Intently, we decided it to be US-based. We know that everyone is not here. Understand that this is a conversation and not the conversation. We are so fortunate today to have planned this event alongside our capable moderator and fellow former presenter, Emil Kang. Emil J. Kang is Program Director for Arts and Culture at the Mellon Foundation, where he leads the grants-making program that centers individual creative accomplishment and conservation practices while advancing a diverse and sustainable arts ecosystem. Previously, Emil worked at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he served as a professor of practice of music and executive and artistic director of Carolina Performing Arts, a major multidiscipline performing arts program that he founded in 2005. In 2016, Emil was named special assistant to the chancellor for the arts and founded Arts Everywhere, a major learning and engagement community-wide initiative dedicated to integrating artist practices, learning, and engagement in the lives of the entire community. Previously, Emil served in a variety of roles with orchestras and symphonies across the country, most recently as president and executive director of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Emil continues to serve as a member of the National Council of the Arts, having been named by President Barack Obama in 2012. Everyone, Emil. Okay, everyone. Oh, I see my colleagues over here. Uh-oh. Emily and Isabel, keep me real. Um, let's see. Thank you, Colleen. So, deep breath, everyone. Deep breath for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Emil Kang. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a middle-aged Asian American man with salt and pepper hair, glasses, uh, blue turtleneck sweater, and I'm um, getting older by the day. <laughs> um, it is my sincere pleasure to be with you today. Be here with you today. I'd like to first thank by start by thanking the members of the IPC steering committee and all the members of the IPC for their leadership, engagement, and commitment to dialogue and change. Secondly, I'd like to thank the outstanding team at HowlRound Theatre Commons for their continued leadership in moving our field forward. They continue to be tremendous partners with us at the Mellon Foundation in so many ways, including, as uh, Jamie mentioned, with their administration of the National Playwright Residency Program. I want to give a special shout out to those in, really involved in planning today, and they include, and I hope I get this right, Jamie, Abigail, Ciara, Joshua, Vijay, Ramona, and Allison at HowlRound, and Kevin at Arts Emerson. Well, I ask you to please join me in a round of applause for all of them. I want to apologize for those who I have my back to. Um, it's not intentional. <laughs> Although there are times I wish I, anyway. Um, it's great to see so many friends and colleagues here. The conversation on listening circles gives us a way to get into a deeper dialogue, I believe, with such a, a large group of people here and online. And as you uh, can gather from the program, um, the group here in front of you today uh, are mirroring those around the, uh, in the, the 
listening circle, and they include presenters, uh, creative producers, artists, and funders. Uh, we have structured this conversation so that for the first 50 or so minutes, the conversation circle, that's this group here, will engage in dialogue. And Abigail will be our timekeeper, so thank you, Abigail. Um, we ask that everyone in the listening circle to hold any questions uh, or comments, but please do, as mentioned, engage in active listening. Uh, at the appropriate time, just after 50 minutes, we will invite your literal participation. And we'll be very interested to hear your, uh, you all expand on the perspectives that have been offered so far. Our sincere wish is for an open, transparent, mutually beneficial, and generous dialogue. To ensure that, I will ask everyone, especially those representing institutions, to use this time to speak as your human selves and not to speak on behalf of your institution. By that, I mean, I hope, um, that uh, we will all be able to express more than answers to questions, um, but our own respective vulnerabilities and truths. As we have an equally important audience on Zoom, I'd like to start by letting everyone know who is here in the conversation circle. I'd like to, like to ask each of you to share your name, your pronouns, affiliation, and offer a brief visual description, all in 30 seconds or less, please. So, I will start to my right to you, maybe. Uh, good morning. Uh, may, my name is Mayan Wang. I'm the producing director of the Ronald O. Perlman Performing Arts Center, uh, which will open in fall of 23. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a Chinese woman with black, starting to gray hair, uh, mid-length, and wearing navy blue. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Orlov. I use he, him pronouns. I am the director of state, regional, and local partnerships and international activities at the National Endowment for the Arts. I am a uh, aging, middle-aged and aging uh, white man uh, with a receding hairline, um, sadly, and a wearing a gray uh, sports coat. Hi, my name is Mara Isaacs. I'm an independent producer and founder of Octopus Theatricals. I am a white woman with brown, unruly, curly hair and glasses and wearing a turtleneck sweater that is mostly black with a touch of gray and tan. My name is Rika Eno. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm a mother, an entrepreneur, and a founder and producer of Sozo. Um, I'm an Asian woman of Japanese descent. I'm wearing a flowy yet structured outfit today. <laughs> I'm Du Yun. I'm a composer and performer. I am short. Um, I'm forever young. And, <laughs> and nice to be here. Oh, what do I wear? A uh, big heart. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ronnie Pinoy. I am Laguna Pueblo in Cherokee. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am delighted to be director of artistic programming at Arts Emerson, uh, as well as joyfully uh, covered in uh, freckles and with a very loud laugh. I have been reaffirmed earlier this morning. Um, so uh, let's see, did I do it? I did it. <laughs> Visual description, uh, long brown hair, white sweater with a big black flower on it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zeba Rahman. I'm South Asian, Afghan, and Indian. And I use the pronouns hum, which means we in Urdu, and all the female pronouns. I'm uh, wearing a red jacket and have sort of middling salt and pepper hair. Hello, everyone. I'm Edgar Miramontes. I use he, him pronouns. I am the deputy executive director and curator of Red Cat at the Roy and Edna Disney Cal Arts Theater. And I am a queer Mexican Latinx uh, wearing a black sweater with a black and white flower print collar <laughs> and glasses, blue glasses. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Samora Pinderhues. Um, I go uh, use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a musician, composer, filmmaker, interdisciplinary artist, and the creator of The Healing Project. Um, and uh, my uh, identity is its own panel, but uh, 
I never know how to answer this question for visual, but um, I'm a, a person of mixed descent, um, and I'm wearing a very fly green serpent outfit. Hi, everyone. My name is Roya Amir Soleimani. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the artistic director and curator of public engagement at PICA, the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art in what is known as Portland, Oregon. And I am a, uh, an Iranian-American woman in my late 30s, uh, dark brown, almost black hair pulled up, black shirt, olive pants, black shoes. All right, thank you all. Um, just so everyone knows, we have uh, three roving microphones in the circle, so I'll ask you to uh, share them freely with each other. Uh, but know that they're always going to be hot, so uh, please, if you are not using it, don't rub it up against yourself or anything like that, um, for lots of reasons, <laughs> um, at least out here in public. Um, thank you very much. Um, as a reminder to everyone, I'll be moderating a conversation with just this group. Uh, and I have a series of prompts that we'll use to get the dialogue going, but I invite all of the members of the conversation circle here to feel free to add to, redirect, move, change the conversations that we start with. And remember that this is not a conversation between me and you all, but with you and each other. Um, so I really hope that we can find a way to be able to be in dialogue with one another uh, and, uh, and to tend to, to shut out everyone else around us because this is what we're hoping to achieve. And the, a reminder, the title of today's session is International Presenting Now, Collaborative Models, Practices and Pathways Towards a Sustainable Future. I feel like we, we don't get into these kinds of dialogues often and we tend to want to talk about all the challenges and problems we face, but I want us to make sure that we, we're keeping the topic today on international presenting. Any questions from the conversation? Circle? No? Are we ready to go? All right. Well, let's get right into it. Our first prompt. It'll bring us um, in at a very high level intentionally and includes a set of questions. Feel free, of course, to respond to any or all of, uh, of it. They are, again, very general high level. What has the global performing arts field learned to date from the COVID era and the pandemic. Two, are there ways that international presenting has changed for the better as a result of the pandemic? And then three, what are the opportunities and challenges for international presenting now? Would you like me to repeat them or are you all set? No, good? Anyone wanna get us, get us started with some very pithy answers? In the um, combining questions one and two, what, what have we learned to date and changes for the better? Um, one of the happy um, side benefits of developing work for digital platforms, which many of us I know have done in various ways during the pandemic, um, is that we discovered that those digital platforms created access um, and for us in particular at Octopus, in collaboration actually with some people in this room at NYU Abu Dhabi um, and Art Emerson, um, we took one of our digital platforms and turned it into a platform for international collaboration. And so actually created a project with artists in Kenya that was broadcast in Abu Dhabi and in the United States. Um, and that project has continued as we have gone back to in-person programming, we have found ways to continue this collaboration with the same group of artists and different um, US presenters as a way of creating access for both the artists and the audiences to work that they would otherwise never have a chance to see. So that's a, a happy story. That's great, thank you. Ronnie? Yeah, I'll just echo um, uh, the the period of the pandemic, uh, I think, really led to a lot of us asking some questions about intentionality. And uh, I know I'm not saying anything new in saying that uh, we all were asking the questions of, what are we really meaning to do? Is it effective? And 
in particular, I think for uh, creative producers with, uh, with SEPA, the Creative and Independent Producer Alliance, with IPC and with others, you really saw an intentional uh, mobilizing around, are we really doing what we mean to do? Should we be doing it differently, better, more in a more climate just way? And also who is being left out of the conversation? So I, I think um, there has been, um, while of course space and time and going uh, and things reopening, I think took uh, a bit of a redirect of attention. Um, I think that all of that intentionality and awareness of the way in which we're doing work, either even if there's ways we still want to uh, shift it, I think that's still happening and that was a real beautiful um, part of that, that time that we had to be away from each other. Thank you, Ronnie. Right? Yeah. Um, I have been thinking a lot about the ways in which the interdependence of our field was revealed in the wake of the pandemic, um, that organizations and artists were facing um, an increasingly vulnerable situation and relied on each other to stay afloat, institutions relying on other institutions, artists on each other, and then everyone um, within communities and within the broader community that, um, that is our field, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, but really, you know, some organizations went away. Some, peop some artists stopped practicing. People made radical decisions and um, were also, uh, left behind, a lot, of, a lot of changes that we all experienced. And, um, and yet there was also, it was a moment for us to realize, I think, our resilience. But uh, going forward, um, the ways in which we have to support one another and work with each other collaboratively and build both informal and formal systems of support and resource redistribution and exchange are gonna be critical for if any international presenting, given the barriers, is going to be possible. I think I forgot to say my affiliation when I was introducing myself. I take care of a program called the Building Bridges Program at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. And just picking up on what you've just said, one of the things that I feel everybody in this room has, which is more valuable than money, is imagination. And, and since we belong to the species, that indomitable human spirit. And it's that, that which gives us the capacity to reimagine, to pivot very quickly and adapt, um, and everything that follows from that. And I, I'm reminded of one thing that it's a pre-pandemic example. Uh, one of our grantees, the Georgetown University Lab for Performance and Politics, was um, in 2014, I think it was, Derek, um, presenting Syria, the Trojan women. And the inevitable happened, which is that the women, the actors in this piece, were denied their visa. And what the lab and its organizers did was create a summit with the Trojan women, um, with the Syrian women, on Skype at the, in those days. This was 2014. And also the audience. They, they collected an audience. So it was a full house. And there was a very poignant moment when the the ladies on Skype, one of them asked, why were we denied our visa? And quickly, um, one of the organizers pointed the mic to the State Department representative who was in the audience then. And he said, it was just a bad day. I hope I'm not mangling this, Derek, but I think this is what it, he said. Um, and I bring this example up because of what the lab did in response to a crisis, which is they could not put on a live performance. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I think just thinking about uh, self-reflection, I think what happened is taking a step back to think as to what, uh, what brought me into the arts to begin with, and, and so thinking about how um, the lack of access I had and to think about the access that um, uh, I wanted to give folks. We continued working um, to uh, work with artists during the pandemic. 
but it was really kind of thinking about um, what difference can I make right now during this time. Um, and we had projects that were um, leaning into uh, working with video. So we paired up a lot of artists with uh, uh, those who had the kind of access to video components and things like that. And so we worked with a Chilean artist, Guillermo Calderon, who had a project that was to come uh, to uh, where we were and made a film with it that was really about the um, uh, democracy shifting in Chile. And so we partnered with Arts Emerson to be able to uh, give the resources to be able to make that film and then have both of our audiences join together. Um, and it was streamed through Arts Emerson and also to our audiences at Red Cat. So this collaborative kind of thinking really quickly and pivoting was really important for me. And thinking about what, why it matters and why, that, uh, why working together matters even more. Um, I just wanted to respond quickly to what, Ronnie, you said about intentionality. And I've been thinking a lot about the move from sort of this short-term value extraction to long-termism, um, as I like to call it. Um, this sort of notion that, you know, performances aren't enough. Um, and how do we, especially as producers, and, and actually shout out to producers in the room <laughs> and, and um, creative producers that are doing this work, this um, attention towards process as the product and how that ultimately stretches the timeline of our work together. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that and you know what that means in terms of um, equivalence in our sector is giving um, a kind of more decision-making authority to the, those on the edges, so artists and producers in my case. And um, for me, it translated into work like ethical and equitable contracting between institutions and artists. It has also translated to um, mentorship and coaching work to empower artists to become entrepreneurs. And these are, these were fast tracked by the pandemic, but things that have been in need for probably decades. Um, where do I start? First of all, I, I, in terms of shout outs, I'll, I'll give a shout out to all the federal employees in the room. I'm the only one. Um, <laughs> It's really humbling and, and inspiring to not just be in a circle with so many incredible folks, but being surrounded by colleagues that you've worked with over the years. And Ronnie brought up um, a couple of words that inspired me to think about um, flexibility. If there's something I learned, and this is in my perch, not as a producer, not as an artist, but as a, a funder, um, flexibility and having the ability to um, allow folks to do work in different ways and, and going to what Rika was saying um, we need to be able to let work take place over time and um, there were some really inspiring conversations that happened at the beginning of the pandemic um, very much about how work is going to be produced, how work is going to be created, and, and I learned a ton about flexibility. And that's something I, I really take to heart. One other thing to mention, it's not something we learned. It was more of an, uh, uh, an affirmation of how much we need in this earth, in creativity, and the arts. I think there was no better <laughs> Um, exclamation mark than the past two years and how important it is that we have um, access to the arts, whether it's in live form, in digital form, in some kind of hybrid. I mean, that, my wife is a, is a, um, a school teacher and so for the first year and a half we share an apartment and she's teaching, you know, six feet away from me, separated by a wall and what I found so incredibly inspiring, she's a math teacher, but every day there was some form of artistic inputs 
being given to the kids because they needed it. And again, I, I think if we all, not this room learning, but the greater world, we need the arts more than ever. And uh, it was a great experience um, in a very bad situation. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take this moment to thank to those of you who paid the artists um, during cancellations, um, because you're not only paying one artist, you're pay paying the household, the lively blood. Um, the, also, you're earning a lot of loyalty to the organizations moving past COVID. I also wanted to um, uh, thank to those organizations who stood up to governments. Uh, the, we, we had wars happening. Um, I, I saw organizations who bypassed the rigorous um, uh, board meeting structure and really called for refugees and for funding, immediate fundings for the war refugees. And, and uh, I saw so many Ukraine artists um, uh, being able to survive that day. Um, so I was also thinking about um, when we are thinking about about make, when artists are thinking about making work, putting on stage, sometimes it's not about this proscenium that we are thinking is a, 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 a piece. It's about human connections. And I wonder about this kind of organizations, what we are doing here, like what in the end, at the core, what are we making? Is it that from end to finish line or is the end well, beginning to end line is something more flexible, as you were saying, and um, and to defy COVID, to defy war, to defy political coup, and so on. So thank you for paying, and thank you for stand up together with us. Thank you, Duyan. Samora. Uh, yes, um, totally echo all of that, and um, <clears throat> also uh, piggybacking off of that, speaking a little bit from the artist perspective, um, of just a few quick thoughts come to mind. Um, one is I, I definitely, you know, I, I think that there was a real reckoning around the um, artist's ability to survive and what the artist's economy looks like in every field. I mean, obviously I can speak to it most specifically through music and then learning through the other disciplines, but, you know, um, without touring, there was like every, no musician was able to live because they had no health insurance, they had no livelihood. And so I think the, the bad part of that was that obviously people were, were wrecked by the, the situation and that they realized that there was no long-term framework for them to survive as is. The positive part I think is that, that number one, that was seen by the wider world, hopefully, and also that it was, um, it opens up a space for it to, be realized that that type of process cannot be enough, where an artist can has has only one means of survival, which requires them to be very unhealthy with their body, to go out and do one show and then to travel to another show the next day and travel to another show the next day. And we have so many artists dying young, you know? And so I think that that's a big concern that I would like to see. And I, I quite frankly think that the institutions are interesting um, space with this because it does go back to that long term that y'all are talking about. Um, the ability and the, the privilege to be able to have a, a physical space or a digital space, whatever, really just a context in which there is a larger um, you know, budget or pot of money that you can build something over time with a collective is so much better in every sense than the model of having to go out and do this one thing here and do this another thing here and do this another thing here the next day. And we're so used to doing that, that is what we do, but I'm very excited about the possibility of flipping that and excited about a lot of the institutions that are interested in working more with those long-term models. And then I think connected to that because of the shutdowns with the institutions with COVID, um, there was possibly some opportunities for the artists to work in those long-term ways, even more directly with the institution, not only to build their own projects, but to transform the institution, and to have a say in what the how the institution is operating, if the institution is open to that. And you know, I've been lucky enough to 
have institutions like Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, where we just were, where they were open to me, you know, working with them on transforming their security practices because we were working on a, a project on the prisons, or open on making all their projects, you know, finding a way to make the, at least certain day, we were able to do the whole thing free, but I know that's not possible sometimes, so at least making certain days free. Doing extra community outreach or international outreach to place, you know, um, people that aren't gonna be on the normal PR media lists, you know? Um, and so I've found that that was an opportunity that maybe wasn't there before because people had to have the turnover of this is what's coming next and this is what's coming next. So I hope that's something that will continue as well. Great, thank you, Samora. Did you wanna add something? Well, Mara? I was only gonna try to bring the conversation please, full circle please, back to the do. international uh, yeah. part of the conversation, which is all of these themes are coming up because for the last three years, we have increased our sense of isolation, um, both within our immediate communities and certainly, you know, we can all talk about what happened politically in this country and, and a kind of political isolationism that COVID then led, COVID then created, thank you, um, a very real isolationism. And when you talk about the challenges of international presenting, I think that in the field at large, we have all felt the setback of people's audience habits aren't the same, none of our habits are the same, and I think we have to, to kind of reopen the pathways for how we collaborate um, as a community within this country to support international work and how we make those um, truly international, make things more porous between, between the countries. You know, I wonder if we can speak a little bit about the porousness because I think, um, Edgar, you mentioned your collaboration with Guillermo Calderon. And, you know, I think it hasn't been very much lifted up here, but I wonder about that sort of, that question of access and um, of literal and metaphoric distance and the ability for the, the commu your communities to be able to engage with artists across many, many distances because of the pandemic and how we, going forward as a field, uh, do a better job of trying to find some balances around uh, the, the, um, the immediacy of, of, of actual presence versus a long distance virtual relationship. And can we actually find a way to try to create a both and reality going forward? And what, what does that look like? And I wonder how you all think about that and, and, and not think of it as uh, visa problems or we can't bring artists here, but it's an opportunity to be able to actually access all kinds of, um, uh, of, of perspectives and forms by artists. And I go back to Rika and I see you have a mic now, Rika but talking about the idea of process of product. Um, there's this notion that I'm studying called real virtualities, that there is um, the real blend and synergy of physical and um, virtual spaces that I, I hear a lot in this space, especially about, oh, in-person is always so much better than virtual, or there's a sort of binary um, understanding of our world, but I think increasingly, um, it's both, and so, you know, how are we embracing that in our process? Um, and I think about Netflix success, for instance, with, you know, hits like Squid Game, for those of you who watch series like that, or Money Heist, you know, they took the sort of defragmentation approach and put the onus on their international producers to create content that appealed to their audiences instead of saying, here is how it works for Hollywood, so you have to make things this way. Um, and that has led to, I think, you know, over 80% of their new subscribers during the pandemic being outside of US and Canada. So I'm thinking about that and thinking about our virtual uh, artists that are creating in these spaces. And so, you know, for me, the cultural cue from something like that isn't like, okay, so let me program a, a Korean artist um, for uh, Asian, uh, <laughs> Uh, Heritage Month or multicultural series, uh, that my cultural cue from something like that, you know, if you take Squid Game again, again as an example, it's um, as much about the popularity of Korean culture as much as it's about, you know, the widening economic inequities. So my cultural response to that would be, okay, so could we find a Korean new media artist working with an American scholar that would bring together a design team from Global South and design a lab for two years. Um, maybe at the end there is a performance, maybe not. 
Um, so that's sort of where my mind is going when I think about virtual and physical. And you know, there's things like Microsoft Mesh, right, that like allows people to engage virtually, not in the solo siloed like goggle world, but in a much more collaborative world. So I think the technology is advancing in really great ways to allow us to um, include not just sights and visuals, but also haptics and sense even. And I know Samora, you did a piece with virtual reality um, element included in that, but artists are doing this work. We don't have to make it up, right? So we're just following the lead of the artists. Thank you, Rika. Anyone else, Samora? Well, I would love also to hear, because we were talking before about that specific collaboration, but so I won't talk too long. But just because you mentioned it, it just made me think that, and I'm sure this is how people are thinking a lot already, but the, um, the way that, that I ended up doing the, the, the VR project, version of the healing project, is just from the question of, how, like, this is the only way that we can get it to these people, right? This is the only way. And so instead of saying, oh, we just can't get it to those folks, it was like, oh, that's the way to get it there, so we have to do that. How do we do that, right? I had no idea how to do that. Then the next version of what we're doing with that for the project, right, is, well, we can't get that into the prisons because JPay, you know, connect all these evil companies, they won't let them have access. So we have to create a book version because that's the only way we can do it is mail it in the, in the send it in the mail, right? So I think that like following this thread of um, asking the question first, um, what is the best version and who does it have to serve? Who does it have to get to? Who does it have to serve? Then figuring out the way how to do that. It seems to me a much better model than the question of how does this work the easiest way, you know? Um, and I find a lot that that's the question that's being asked instead. Um. Yeah, no, I think uh, in talking about learning um, and lessons learned during the uh, pandemic, but also just thinking about um, uh, creating work internationally or commissioning new work internationally, uh, uh, how does it reach the communities that you're working with in advance? And so part of the thinking of developing new work is thinking about uh, not being afraid of the technology or of the Zoom that we think that we've over Zoomed, but to think about um, how we can bring in our communities that we're serving and the cities that we are um, that are reflecting the work that is being made across the borders and um, begin to kind of think through what that connection is, even if it's virtual. And then also, if you could, as, as, a, as a place of gathering, invite folks to come there who don't have access to their own internet service, perhaps, or um, to kind of just think about elongating that process throughout the time so that when they do come and make that work, um, they already have a connection to that artist um, when they come to present the work um, or do something in person. I think that there is a, a fear of like uh, the liveness being lost in the, in the uh, context of, of, of technology, but I think that there's, it actually gave us an opportunity to, to try to figure out how to connect and elongate that kind of relationship with artists and their communities that they're serving and who you're serving in your communities as well. Um, thinking about digital communities, actually, they exist and they really uh, are really um, robust. And so how do we also think about that as well? Um, um, I'd like to add to the technology question and also the uh, point about porosity in the collective, working in the collective and how rich that is. And it reminds me, since we're sitting in circles, of the Zulu practice of Ubuntu, which is um, a practice, well, in one dimension of it, when somebody does something bad in the community, the entire community surrounds that person for three days and three nights and never leaves them. And that includes children all the way up to uh, elders in the community. And every single person, including children, tell that person something good about them. And after three days, the circle opens and the person is free to go back to his life. And I think that sense of empowering and using the circle to reinforce the good and the, the value 
of people, as opposed to, you mentioned fear, but in a slightly different context, but fear drives so much isolation and separatism that in this moment of crisis and, and uh, really using what we've learned from the pandemic to our benefit, um, I, I think a lot about Ubuntu and its value. Thank you, Zeba. I want to keep us going. I do want to follow up, Rika, on one thing you said about um, not having to make it up and that artists already have been doing this and uh, we need to follow the artist. So then I wonder why, going back to the examples that you gave um, uh, around collaboration and working, so what is preventing our field from working in this way? What is preventing our world from uh, listening to the artists, from working with them, from um, uh, looking at the marketplace as not a place for finished product, but a place to uh, consummate relationships? How, what's standing in the way in your, in your mind as a creative producer? Um, I, think, I think there is hope in the sense that I don't feel like on a daily basis there is a kind of a wall that's preventing us. Um, artists don't see that wall um, when they're in the mode of creating. I think that um, we, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the flower growing from the concrete cracks. You know, we just kind of figure it out. So there is an incredible amount of entrepreneurship and innovation um, outside of the art sector that artists that are dealing with technology, I think, are constantly looking for clues outside of this particular sector. So as producers, we're learning from that as well. So conversations with tech industries, um, civic entities, what have you, um, are kind of part of our daily lives. Um, now, I think in terms of funding um, and sort of how um, we're often forced to kind of think programmatically about how we fit into boxes, I think that's the biggest challenge is that there is this um, gravity pull <laughs> towards thinking about our work in boxes and sometimes literal, right, like theaters. So, um, so we just have to be really co-creative cool together about space and um, audience experience. I wonder, um, just one more follow up uh, about those boxes, Rika. Um, Samora, you and I talked briefly about, and I'm sorry for jumping in, but briefly earlier, many months ago, about um, some of the challenges you, you had about dealing with those boxes. And I, about, I, and I wonder if you can just share a bit about that story of, 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 of sort of the, of the complications that presenters felt with your, the multiplicity of, of, your, of your humanity. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, essentially, you know, I mean, just to give background for context very quick, so I obviously grew up and like was a practicing musician for most of my life and have become an interdisciplinary artist creating different types of things for, I would say, the last five to ten years. And I had already established myself to a certain extent as a musician. And so once I started wanting to make things that were not music, that was, that was film and that was exhibition and that was, you know, whatever. And also also things that weren't inside of one genre. Um, even, I found that even when I was able to articulate what it was about and what it would do, people would still get stuck on the, the question of, well, but you're a jazz musician. Like, are you gonna play the piano and like solo? And I was like, nah, like I'm not about to do that. So, you know, it got very confusing for people, I think, for whatever reason. And I think, you know, the, the, to give, to give um, credit or to give understanding to it, I think to me it comes down to a, the reality of, tr of trust, I'm sorry, right? So what I understood it to be was, we know you can do this thing, do we trust you can do this other thing when you say you can do it? And I get that because I understand that there's only a certain number of slots for people to program, there's money involved and everything. That being said, it does limit the artist's ability to expand. And I think one of the most exciting elements of this moment right now is that there are so many artists that do not want to be defined, that are expanding themselves, that are not saying, I'm just this one thing and I'm only going to make this one kind of music or this one kind of dance. And we, in a certain way, venerate like the Donald Glovers of the world in that, in, that are able to transcend because they've gotten to this you know, point of famous, famousness to where they're able to transcend that. But I think, I think when you're not that, it is very difficult to transcend those blocks in every situ situation from 
the labels to you know the institutions to the funders they really want you to be able to be inside of this one context and so i think that yeah that's something that i'm excited to see people transcend i hope that answered which yeah, yeah thank you um, do you and then and then mayan um i i i wanted to point out that um when we are making Anything digital is actually very, very expensive. Sometimes even more expensive than putting a live show. And also, it also needs to have person-to-person, real-time co collaboration for the artist, I mean, from the artists. It's not something that you sit at your desk and voila, and you're making a Netflix looking video. It's, it's not happened, and, and the, the editor charges a lot of money, they charge on a market rate. And we're not even talking about equipment. So, so I was also wondering, like, I feel like there is a lacking of the presenters to the finished products, and I wonder about the like, corporate sponsorship, right? Because I know, I see eyes, and I know how hard it is, but when I hear this again and again about this, like, you know, the user products and the artists just like, we are running around the circles. Just like, how can I get a projector? How can I get the glasses? How can I get those video? Who is the video player? Like, who's the, um, the editor? Who's the colorist? Who's gonna make those happen? And it's that kind of scale is completely different than you make your iPhone and do something. And because in the finished product, we all wanted something fancy. And we say we have seven thousand dollars to do a twenty-minute piece, and you're just like, "What?" Yeah. Thank you, Duyan. Um, just wanted to respond to um, Samora's point about boxes and not being in boxes. Uh, so what? So I'm at, I'm at the Perlman, and uh, we are producers and presenters, right? And one of the things that I, because of my my background with Under the Radar and as a creative producer, really sort of respect and want to fold into that um, uh, uh, impulse, right? Just whatever you're doing, let's not put a box around it. But what's very, uh, uh, and this is part of the, the producer, the creative producer side of it, is how do you um, create the structure in which the artist can be free to, to make the thing, but there's so many union structures, I mean, that, those are the boring conversations, but that's, that's the thing that we're doing, right? And so the thing that's been sort of going around my mind since this morning is this idea of like Jerry Maguire, <laughs> right? This idea of, of course, process, of course, artists, but there's the, do we, do we just have one client, right? And as an organization and, 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 and the pro men, like that, that is not our remit and, and the mission. And so we have to go like, who, who are, who are our Cuba Gooding Juniors, you know, that, that we have to concentrate on. And, and so, like, we can't, as an organization, I keep thinking about it, and me as a producer in my time, of how can we, um, how do we sort of identify the artists and have that long-term process, right? And then there's some other projects that, honestly, you just have to be more transactional, right? And we, we can't be, um, we can have, so many projects that is about that process because we want to be able to put our resources, our producers, our, you know, our general management mind, contracting minds to sort of like go into that. Um, so that is, you know, when, when Emil's like, be a human, that's what I'm struggling with because I want to do that with all of the artists that we're working with, but then I would, we would have three and that is sort of not the, that can't be sort of the, the you know, all of, all of what this organization, this theater is doing. Um, yeah. Um, I am thinking about uh, what was said about the value of digital programming and um, how artists are already working in those realms, as you said, Rika, and um, that there's a place for that and that also I think we're all here because we do believe in international presentation and exchange in real time and space. And um, when I think about, also related to p kind of post pandemic or in the wake of the pandemic, when I think about what we're facing right now in terms of the challenges to international and global exchange in performance, which 
is we often think of as funding related or lack thereof, borders, visas, all of these barriers. This is also happening in tandem. All of the no's, all of the we can't do that anymore, we can't do that in this way, it's not possible any longer. All of that is happening in tandem with this moment when we are reckoning with the, the fact that this field has been so white. The gender, the gender disparities, the racial disparities. And we're saying now, now the institutions are going to pay attention to artists of color and, and arts, arts leaders coming up in this next generation. Now we're gonna support um, you know, queer and non-binary and trans artists. All of these artists now are getting their work produced and made and um, artists and young arts leaders and arts administrators and curators of color are finally coming up. But we're all being told there's no money and you can't travel. And actually, if you're gonna be responsible to the climate crisis, you shouldn't be going anywhere. And so all of us are contending with um, so, so, so few opportunities for actual in-person exchange for our careers um, for, you know, again, artists and arts administrators, because we're all in this together. But what are we saying to this young generation that is more diverse than ever before because we're finally doing the right thing in saying, no, we have to scale everything back and you have to put it online. I just don't think it's fair and we have to do better for the generation coming up. Um, because that's who we're saying we've failed for so long as a field. Um, so we've got to figure out how to make this kind of work and these kinds of exchanges continue because we owe it to the people who aren't in this room because they are the, they're not even just the next gen. They're like in their, te their teens, you know? And they're gonna be us and they're gonna be sitting in this room and they need to have, they deserve to have these experiences as artists and as programmers and presenters. Um, if this were a Zoom, I would put plus one on that. <laughs> Um, or plus a thousand. Um, very well said, Roya. I, I, I wanted to go back to maybe the original prompt, Emil, about hurdles. No, no, it's fine. Um, and this is more from the funding perspective. I, I talked about flexibility, but also um, stepping into a space of humility, um, of being a funder and being able to acknowledge that you don't have the answers to everything and that, you know, what you were saying before, Samora, about um, not wanting to be put in a box, funders have to be able to respond to that. And I have done a lot of soul searching these past couple of years um, about trying to figure out how we best support the field. And it's okay to be a funder and actually not have the answers and ask for help and ask this incredible you know, room of folks and beyond how we better support you know, creativity in this country and, and beyond. And I, I think that's something people forget. Humility is, is um, not necessarily the, the best character strength of, of funders around, around the country. And um, that's something that I've carried along with flexibility is trying to figure out how we can support. Um, you know, I've been in conversations recently um, and this, I'm, I'm not gonna take us in a different direction, but I'm just using this as an example. You know, is the 501c3 system we have the best system? We've been using it for 40 plus, 50 plus years. You know, should we stand up and say, hey, maybe we need to rethink this? We don't have the answers. Um, you know, being humble and actually asking your colleagues questions about how we can work collectively better. So that's just, it's not a, a, an answer to your question as much as an acknowledgement of what some hurdles are. We have, we have five minutes left, but um, I, I, I don't want to stop the flow. Ronnie, I think you yeah. wanted to go in first. I'm sorry, I'm not speaking to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, um, building on what Michael said, I wanted to reintroduce the notion of imagination, not as an aspirational uh, goal, but really as a muscle in response to the question of what's, what's holding us back. Because of course we can think of the things um, that are not uh, at hand, and, uh, and the obstacles. I think we probably could be here all day listing them, but there's so much that we already have in this circle, in, in this room, and beyond, that with, uh, with imagination and, and intentionality, 
we can do a great many things because we've seen all of the examples that we already have. I mean, I'm hearing so much about the porousness, uh, not only of um, technology, the porousness of um, the kind of boxes that we're in, the porousness of um, uh, thinking not about the work as a uh, commodity, but about international exchange as something um, that is a, a conversation over time. It's trust over time, and it's uh, there is porousness of time in terms of it doesn't have to just be about the the work on stage. So, you know, I I think so much about the. Uh, um, building on all of the brilliant ideas that we already know about through um, intentional and structured networks. And then the only other thing I'll offer to the point of, um, Rika, what you mentioned about other sectors, is that there are, uh, we, we talked earlier this morning and yesterday a lot about uh, international arts exchange as an act of cultural diplomacy. And while uh, climate justice, and I'll say for me as an indigenous person, climate justice is paramount for me, um, when we think about equity and when we think about the crises uh, and the opportunities in our world right now, um, the, so many of us know intrinsically uh, the power of um, artistic experience and exchange to transform, and how are we making the case to others in other fields and others who would love to participate, um, but you know, we have to come together across that difference. We have to be in a position of humility with other sectors, whether it's international policy or environmental rights or, you know, there's so many possibilities when we exercise imagination and put ourselves outside of our comfort zones. Thank you, Ronnie. Mara, you want to take us out here? I'll do my best. I, I'm going to try to link a bunch of things. Great. Um, I, if, Picking up on what you were saying, I think taking that imagination to really try to put into the sp space what does success look like if we actually are able to move ourselves forward. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the boxing and also the what we're setting up this next generation for. And I think we have to acknowledge that, although we don't want to focus on this kind of culture of scarcity, the notion of room for error um, that margin has gotten a lot narrower than I think we perceive it used to be. Whether or not it actually has, I don't know, but the perception is there is no room for error anymore. And so I think the resistance to um, risk taking with an artist when they know they're proven over here is, is that there is no room for error anymore. And so as, as we imagine success and as we imagine what, our, what we want the desired outcomes to be, I would like to put into the room figuring out how to expand what success looks like so that there is room for error within that so that we can take those risks with artists, with collaborators, with people that we're bringing in, with what, what our audience's experiences are. Um, because we have gotten into a, um, a guarantee of experience way of looking at the arts in this world. And I think that's the thing we need to try to break out of. Uh, I just want to... Um bring this all together by just talking a little bit about um, the separation from art and artist, the distinction between the two, and the relationship that I think for so long our field has been focused on the product, as, as we know, and not on the humanity of the artist. And I, I wonder in all the ways that we've talked about here, if the marketplace for art can shift to the marketplace of artists, and what does that mean? That sounds a little manipulative, and I don't mean it to be, but the idea where we're actually seeking relationships with others, and that's what we're actually working on, and we're not focused on what the product is. And I know that seems quite obvious, but I feel like what we're hearing from the artists in this room in particular um, is that they're still struggling to find a way to build relationships with the ecosystem of presenting in the world, both locally and abroad, that actually sees them um, for their full humanity. And so what, what does it mean, and how do the structures, whether it's the nonprofit sector or the for-profit sector or um, our world as a, as a whole, how, how do we create the structures that we need that actually can um, celebrate those things that we're all actually trying to do here? And we don't have to answer that question now, um, <laughs> but I guess this would be just a good moment, and is this time, um, to think about opening it up to the larger group here. Um, we, um, let me just make sure I move on here. Uh, so we'd like to, to now open it up to the, to the listening circle. Um, and we would invite any of you in the listening circle um, who have anything to be able to share to feel free to uh, take an empty seat. 
We invite those in this conversation circle uh, who are um, compelled to rise and vacate your seat. Um, you don't have to leave, but if you feel compelled to leave, um, to uh, feel free to make, make space for others. But please don't all leave at once. Um, uh, for those of you who will be joining us, we ask you to remember to use your mic um, and to begin with your name, your pronouns, uh, and a brief visual description like others have done. And please to be mindful of the space you're talking and the space you're taking in this conversation circle. Uh, for those watching online, um, the How Round team will be keeping an eye on the video chat and uh, may bring forth a question or comment or two from you uh, on, on Zoom into the, inter into the uh, conversation circle during our discussion. So um, would anyone like to, oh, thank you, Zeva. <laughs> And so we invite any of you in the listening circle to, uh, and the listeners to please step forward if, if you'd care to. Do we have a first brave soul? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Lindsay Bostwick. I'm a queer woman of small stature wearing a <laughs> black and white textured dress, and I have been at the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi for many years, now back working in the States at a resource center uh, for emerging artists at NYU. And thank you all for this conversation. Uh, oh, sorry, I should say she, hers, hers pronouns. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up um, during this time that I thought about deeply, along with my colleague Bill Bragan, what is the role and the obligation of those of us working in well-established institutions and higher education for those who are more at risk, for our creative producers, for our artists, for those of us who want to take risks, but from a financial place didn't have to in the sense of our livelihood being at risk for the work that we did. So what can we do? And I think about artists like Maclete Hedero, who is both a brilliant artist, programmer, and curator, and the work she put forward with Yerba Buena with guaranteed stipends for artists. How do we not just think of that as a small Band-Aid, but how do we think of that, and how do we think about having producers and residents at universities? How do we think about providing space so that we're mitigating risk for other people along our field? So just a thought. Thank you, Lindsay. Duyen? Oh, I just want to bring a point and then I'll leave. Um, <laughs> um, um, I, my, thank you for um, saying that, especially in regards to international, um, bringing international um, artists or communities, because a lot of the work is not just about artists, it's also about the communities that they are coming from and who they are serving, and, and especially when they return to their native land and what that kind of sustainable uh, dialogue could be and could imagine. So sometimes I always think that aftercare um, is really important to, to have after you program that piece, maybe that kind of continued dialogue because sometimes it's not just about the artist, that work itself, it's about that community, that dialogue, that kind of really uh, continue to, 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 to shift that ecosystem in their native land. So that I think is super, super important. And also how to kind of immediate um, uh, the, 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 the West uh, press, uh, Sometimes maybe it's not about review, maybe it's about previews, maybe it's about story, maybe it's about something because when we are um, programming artists coming from certain regions, um, they have to go back and still have a sustainable career. So that kind of very careful um, uh, uh, name that do not just check off organizational uh, mission statements, but their own um, livelihood is very important to think about too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Duyan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and please feel free to join us, but in the meanwhile, Ronnie, please jump yeah, in. Yeah, I'll make a, just a quick 
um, comment, um, something that came up uh, in some of the mornings, this morning's conversation that I think responds to your question is, you know, this idea of a co-op model. So um, I think Edgar, you might have brought it up. Um, so not to speak for you, but I was so excited by it. Um, you know, the notion that for uh, for larger institutions or individuals, you know, who really believe in this. Uh, work. How are we pulling together to do to really support some of the initiatives and people, um, whether it's uh, you know creative producers, whether it's um, artists, you know the systemic uh, change that we want to see. How are we all pulling together to be able to do that? Uh, I think is really important. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua Heim, and I am a. Um, I use he, him pronouns. I am a uh, mixed race, Asian American, Caucasian man with black hair, black glasses, and a black shirt. I'm, I'm an arts person, obviously. And um, I just really appreciate this uh, opportunity and this conversation. I'm very new to this particular community. Um, I am now the new executive director of the Western Arts Alliance, and we have a very significant program in this space around international arts. And we do so in partnership with Michael, uh, with the NEA. It's, the program is called the Performing Arts Discovery PAD program. Um, but I only started this in September. Before that, I had a life in government. And I wanted to pick up on the conversation about risk. And a couple of things we've talked about, Ronnie, what you talked about diplomacy. Um, I was a, a deputy director of a quasi-governmental funding agency, a local funding agency in the Seattle area. And we administered nearly $15 million of CARES and, and, and ARPA funds. Um, and I oversaw all of our grant making programs. And I will say that uh, w you know, what was revealed in these last two years, whether it's local, domestic, or, or international, is that power systems in general, we all know what they are now. We saw them. And we also saw how tenuous they were and how arbitrary our rules are. And I will say from the point of view of a funder, Right? We, as a government funder, we have a lot of rules, and they all went out the door. My colleagues at the city level, my colleagues across the country at the government level, the NEA, all of a sudden, right, we were getting money from places where we don't normally get. We didn't have to report in the same ways. Um, some of, uh, many of our um, fa uh, private family foundations excused the need to prove outcomes. What? So talk about imagination. It is possible. What did, we, what did we learn? What have we learned over the last two years is that anything is possible. And right now, we have the opportunity that that door is closing really quickly with regards to whether or not we're going to go back or what these new rules are, which I think are actually really, really fuzzy. But specifically, you know, you're bringing up risk. And I will just say that um, uh, one thing that we learned in our practice, the place was called For Culture, and now even at the Western Arts Alliance, or WA, is um, it is not right to put the risk at the tail end of the transaction, which is the artist. And right now, right, the artists are bearing 85% of the risk. And it took heaven and earth to work with our, our government partners to actually, for us to assume that risk. And the way that we were able to do it was to think more like um, private actors and more like businesses. So going back to what, um, I don't know where he went, Michael, and talking about is the 501c3 model the right model? Well, I will say that we all should be reminded that in these last two years, right, the single biggest influx of public funding that we have seen since the New Deal didn't come from this community. It came from commercial music venues with Save Our Stages, they built the advocacy and the message to get, I, I can't remember what the figure was, billions of dollars, right? 15, right, like billion. It was incredible. And so, in other words, and we have a lot to learn, I think, from expanding our purview from um, MFA artists, I don't know what the other way to talk about it, but to include a much wider um, uh, understanding of what, who our universe is, because at this move, um, um, point forward, I think we all know that partnership, partnership has to happen. As you were talking about, Roya, partnership has to happen artist to artist, artist to institution. I think it now has to happen with you know, local businesses, whether they're, they're commercial venues or not. 
And um, the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, it's more like an announcement. Um, I've only been here for three months. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have this really big important grant from the US Department of Commerce. And we've been given money to um, send delegates of agents and artists to international markets in Australia, in Colombia, and uh, Germany. Um, it's commerce. Where do we sign up for that? Right. <laughs> and this isn't about diplomacy. This isn't about um, you know, right, conferring uh, national identity and pride. This is actually about making money. And so, although I do agree with what you were saying, Ronnie, about uh, the importance of diplomacy, I think perhaps this is a moment where we need to maybe claw back the importance of business, the importance of sustainability for artists, that what they're doing isn't charity, that actually what they're doing is, is making money for us all. So that, those are some of the perspectives I wanted to share. Uh, thank you. I, I want to actually just uh, follow up happily on many of the things you introduced, because you're actually touching on from a really interesting perspective, a lot of the themes that the IPC has been discussing. We've been talking about going outside of our normal networks to, to create partnerships outside of the traditional art sector, and I think that that's something that we should really try to activate maybe in this conversation. Um, and I've already lost my train of thought, so I'm gonna open the phone. I'm, I'm really glad, oh, I'm sorry. I'm Susan Feldman. Um, I'm she, her, I have curly hair. It's short, I'm um, wearing a gray blouse and black pants. Um, I'm so glad you brought up the... Um, oh, and, and you're at St. Anne's Warehouse. And I'm in St. Anne's Warehouse, yes. <laughs> Which I helped build. Um, I, I'm so glad you brought up the government subsidy of the last few years because that was an incredible influx that basically saved, and also the foundations like, like Mellon, like Gilman, like the ones that came up with huge amounts of money to basically save the industry, or to try to save the industry. And that can't be denied. It, it, was, it, gave, it gave almost every institution and artist the opportunity to survive. Um, so it'd be nice if that could become a sustainable thing so it doesn't have to only happen in crisis, but that it becomes something over time that uh, is part of the ecosystem. The other thing I just really want to um, acknowledge is the interdependence of the global international relationships. So for example, um, St. Anne's is able to bring uh, shows here from other countries, in part because we have the support of governments from other countries. And there's no one source that carries all of us or any of us. So it is that combination of, of the international governments that give us support, huge support, in some cases. Uh, it's the private sector, it's the, it's the foundations, but I think it has to be acknowledged that it's not just us alone in this country trying to figure out how to work internationally. It's an international, interdependent uh, organism, very similar to the, to the economic organisms. So um, I think we all have to work at it together uh, so that no one is carrying the full burden. I know you feel the burden as a funder. We feel the burdens as presenters. You feel it as the producer. So it's really the interdependence of how we're going to share it in order to support the art so that it can happen. So that's my main point. Um, Thank you, Susan. Just in, continuing to invite others to join us. We have two seats here in this very comfortable conversation circle. Go ahead, Rika. Before I ex excuse myself from the sea, I just wanted Germany just reminded me that there is an organization called Purpose Foundation, and I think out of Hamburg, that is pioneering a, a kind of um, uh, what, what they're calling steward ownership, but a, a kind of new economy um, that is impacting the creative um, sector as well. And there's an organization that's U.S.-based that's called Creative Action Network that has gotten funding from Purpose Foundation to remain a for-profit, yet um, get, getting a group of um, investors and philanthropists and nonprofits to sort of invest in the for-profit model, whereby um, the organization is um, uh, sort of led by stewards and the control remains in the, in, in the in hands of the stewards rather than, I guess, what, has, you know, what capitalism has sort of perpetuated, which is this shareholder control. 
And so I've been thinking about how the art sector can learn from it in terms of where the control lies and power lies. And um, so Purpose Foundation is something that um, maybe you know, we can take cues from. I think there's too much of an outlier. There hope, hopefully there's more that like, looks to the hybrid models of impact investment um, into the creative um, sector, but that's one that has come up in my research, so I just wanted to share that. Hey, Jennifer. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Jennifer Harrison Newman, uh, she, her, hers. Um, very pale right now, uh, light-skinned black woman. It is January. Um, with curly hair, wearing a sweater with an image of a two eyes, a nose, and a mouth on it. Um, I want to come as my human being self, but will acknowledge that I also walk into the room as a creative collaborator, as an independent producer, and as the associate artistic director at a new performance venue, student center at Yale called the Schwarzen Center. Um, so I know many people in this room already from various, various points. Um, and I'm responding to a few things that I've heard today um, and want to sort of frame my, my questions or my, my responses in the sense that I'm coming from this, uh, a very real place now of a startup within a university um, whose mission at the moment is, is, is to be a place for the arts and also a student center. So we have a, several different um, sort of stakeholders that we're responding to. Um, as a maker, as a creative producer, I am so, and have been, you know, in many rooms over the last three years, and am so keenly aware of the needs and the desires of the sector from the artist's point of view, from the presenter's point of view, from the funder's point of view. And I'm sort of responding to Lindsay's question about what can universities do to sort of be a part of the, the, the I guess, the answer, the solutions. Um, just want to put out there that the, those structures, the rules, the, you know, the rules that you mentioned, the glacial pace of change in some organizations, that um, as a creative producer who, who wants to put the artist's work forward, who sees the, the value of long-term relationships, as Rika um, brought up, um, development processes. So wondering, and I'm just putting this into the room, mostly as a response to Lindsay, is as a new space, uh, how to build a structure that does, what can we offer? What can I you know, hope to offer um, that, that brings value to the sector, brings value to the artists, um, whether they're national, local, or international? Um, how can I think of a space? You know, as we're new and starting up, what are the things that we can be doing uh, to respond to the to current need? Jennifer, thank you. Um, I do want to hold some more, if you won't mind. Um, uh, just, I think, opportunity for Lindsay, if you're willing to respond to Jennifer. And then, I know there are many presenters in the room who actually uh, could, could, could offer some, some really great ideas for Jennifer, too. So I invite you all to join us, because we have two seats still here uh, for you to join. But uh, Lindsay and then Michelle, thank you for joining us, too. Lindsay, maybe over to you. Thank you, and thanks, everyone, for um, answering this call in a way. And I guess one thing that I wanted to say in response, because it is something that we've thought about that, that Bill and I in Abu Dhabi think about a lot, is the fact of kind of how do we unearth the larger structural um, divides that happen in universities around the hierarchy of where the arts fit in, and how by doing that, by that disruption, we are able to access more visibility, more funding, more the idea of art as research, which somehow becomes more valuable, but also answers the idea of process, right? So when we reframe arts practice as research, we're also answering a lot of things and we can access things and we can provide that visibility, which hopefully will create some, some buzz, some time, some resources, and answer some of those. Michelle, thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Witt. I'm executive and artistic director of the Meany Center for the Performing Arts in Seattle um, at the University of Washington. And I am, uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am wearing a black turtleneck, gray jacket, uh, glasses. And um, I'd like to reflect such provocative questions. And I'd like to reflect on what I've 
some big things that I've heard and um, and share a perspective, which is, you know, we're talking about building things collaboratively over time, building relationships with artists, um, and including artists in the fabric of institutions, um, focusing on process, which is so critical, um, and also sometimes really needing to have that transactional product out there, um, because that's important too to sustaining our institutions. And then thinking about, um, but I'd like to add in the international piece here, you know, thinking about international arts exchange as a form of cultural diplomacy, um, a, a form of uh, working with other sectors. And, um, and I think thinking about what success looks like here is really critical to understand because we can, as universities, as institutions with spaces and connections to other types of research happening, we have, uh, we, we can be laboratories for um, long-term relationships with artists, focus on the process. Mian was a creative fellow, or a Mellon creative fellow at the University of Washington. We're uh, you know, able to focus on process over time with an open-ended um, research goal. Um, but what does it look like when we start to really think outside the arts box and build relationships with other sectors, both within an institution, whether it's with the national, natural sciences or the social sciences, or whether it's with um, climate scientists or others? And what does success look like in an international context where we're working across both virtual and in-person platforms over time? And I'd like to leave the room with that question because I'm really curious to know what you all would say. Hi, Bill. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Derek, Bill, do you have anything? But before, actually before, some more, I, I'm sorry I stopped you from speaking, but did, did you want to add something that first before we, I, well, I, I'm mindful of cutting off no, the, no, an no, artist in good, the room, so. I, I, it, you were right because I had something else to say that was not about this, but I do have something to say about in universities. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But just as a PhD, current PhD student at a university, um, what I would say is a couple things this is just to think about. I don't obviously don't know how anything runs. This is just things I'm thinking about. One is the university tends to be the largest landowner in the city. So I'm wondering how what that means, how that can be affected, how that can be dealt with, leveraged, et cetera. Um, I, it tends to just be a totally separate part of how we talk about the university is like the university as the arts, the university as the education, and then, oh, by the way, the university is also the biggest landowner in New York City, in Boston, you know, all these different places. And as a result, you know, there's ramifications to that, obviously in terms of gentrification, et cetera, but there's also the realities that um, they tend to be the biggest, some of the biggest power builders in the, in the, in the space, right? And so I think that I would like to see how, um, that can be uh, challenged in a certain way, and also how that can be uh, used since it's there in the sense that, um, for instance, uh, because there's so much power there, how can we ask artists uh, what they have to say about that? How can we ask artists um, how, what they wanna talk about in terms of challenging the police department in that city? Because the university is so powerful you know, in that context. Um, the other thing, the other way I would say it is, I would love to see how, um, I think a lot of artists have a lot of ideas, um, but they aren't necessarily always allowed to play out those ideas in an academic context unless they are PhD students or something like that. And so I would love to see more context in which the artists are brought in and are like, uh, there's some early work done around how can we bring them into contact with these student unions or these people on campus that are really working on the same things that they're working on and they can affect each other. And I just think that that would be really powerful. And I think particularly because the, the university is a place where there's a lot of international work going on, that would be very powerful in an international context. Thank you, Samora. Well, I think your wish is here. Um, we have two additional university representatives at the room now. We're Derek. actually the same person, so it doesn't matter who you said <laughs> Well, I'll hand it over to you first, Derek. Um, except I don't look like Elvis Costello, so sorry, sorry. Um, uh, my name is Derek Goldman. Um, this is really, really energizing and inspiring to be in this real room. Um, I use uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I am, uh, have graying, uh, thinning hair, glasses, a black jacket, and a 
a scarf that enacts a theatrical cliche. Um, and um, I am a director of the Lab for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Um, and I just, this whole conversation has, you know, sort of uh, beautiful um, reverberations and, and echoes. I would just share um, one of the interesting things about our, the lab, our mission is to humanize global politics through performance, and we're a little unusual in being housed primarily in a school of international relations in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, though my, you know, I'm a theater maker and my faculty position has primarily been in theater. And I think when the lab was, was founded, we uh, expected that the journey would be about the arts people really kind of getting it and supporting it, and little by little we would drag along others in other sectors. And in many ways, and I think the pandemic actually amplified this, our experience has been the reverse of that. Um, that the, you know, we being in Washington with a network of incredible artists around the world, young artists to kind of bring to the table, we became, you know, a little bit, we were able to be the cool kids in a lot of contexts <laughs> that, um, that have allowed, that for me personally, um, kind of made me shift from kind of migrating to rooms where I felt comfortable and safe and where I knew what my role was as a theater maker and towards rooms where I might be the only artist in the room. Um, in, in, and some of them, you know, some of them were, were fruitful, some of them were less fruitful, but starting to spend more time in um, among climate activists among people working on migration and not always knowing what I was doing there or what the result would be there. Um, and then being inspired by our students and our fellows who were sort of doing the same thing. And I guess what I would just sort of offer is that I think the, the, the parts of this, the most hopeful thing for us during the pandemic was having um, access on a monthly basis to this extraordinary network of Lab Global Fellows, who are these 30 artists from different parts of the world, most of whom working in relatively isolate, in isolation, who self-identify as change makers. Um, and it's not false modesty to say the Lab's program, I don't think, was about anything the Lab was giving them or anything that the prestige of Georgetown University was giving them, but it was really about what they give each other, and they became really a kind of lifeline for each other through that process. And many of them are very unlikely combinations of people. We're not, it's not an industry-driven model. And so I think I'm just coming into the circle to kind of try to sort of like advocate for um, continued really sort of like put, like mixing the stew in very unusual ways and trusting that like this artist working in refugee environments in Cambodia and this artist from Zimbabwe who have totally different ways of defining themselves might have nothing they need except the chance to sort of be together and supported in that work. Um, and a lot of the rest of us, you know, can move out of the way a little bit from that, so. Thank you, Derek. Bill. So I'm Bill Bragan, he, him. I am the Executive Artistic Director at the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi, so I am re representing somebody working outside the US primarily, but I'm also a co-founder of Global Fest, which for 20 years has been bringing artists from abroad to the US, so I'm kind of part of both sides of that. I am, uh, I've got dark-ish, hair and a salt and pepper beard and glasses and according to Derek I look like Elvis Costello and I had an Elvis Costello centerpiece at my, bar, at my bar mitzvah and I'm wearing a shirt that's not polka dot but reads like polka dot. Uh, so my high functioning ADHD mind is flying around and trying to bring a lot of these different points together going back to the original prompt about sort of what did we learn and I think that one of the things and what kind of we learned and held on to was the necessity for ongoing really deep and very candid conversation with the artists that I work with. I think Lindsay and I, uh, with a lot of people here, uh, spent two years having like really 
personal conversations, checking in like every two to four weeks. How are you doing? What's the situation where you are? What's the situation where I am? I think that question of equity I think really came out because I think we were all aware that the conditions based on where you were in the world and what your role was in that world was really, really different. And I think one of the reasons, for example, the Theater for One project that Mara was talking about worked with us in Abu Dhabi and a group of artists in Nairobi and producers working in the US was that we were all really, really transparent that we had different things to bring to the table and those shifted based on the conditions. And when we had a virtual one-on-one -on -one digital, uh, digital theater project that could only be delivered over the internet and there was a nationwide power blackout in Nairobi, the artists in Nairobi knew how to actually have the show anyway, despite a national background. They, there was a knowledge base that we didn't have. What we had was financial resources that we could put to kind of buying the equipment so that they could do it. And so I think that that radical acknowledgement and the communication, I think, is one of the things that really comes from it. I think the, the sort of, to the, Jennifer and I had a conversation a little bit about this topic this summer about the what can you do. And I think in that conversation is also then the conversation between the institutions and the organizations about what do you need as an artist? What do we have? What are the capabilities? We have to, I think it was been mentioned, like we have to justify it internally. Is this research, if we're doing one-on-one -on -one micro theater, it will never, ever, ever scale. The Commerce Department will never support that argument, but maybe cultural exchange will. Certainly we learned an enormous amount as an institution about sort of stepping into the unknown with an artist. But I do also think about that sort of intensity and that shift in the practice and the sort of shift to slower touring and deeper engagements and relationships that also reduce the, the climate impact and maybe the cost of spending all the budget on plane fares rather than on salaries is to the point that Roya brought up and I think about it a lot curatorially, that means I'm gonna work with fewer artists and as we're also as institutions and now it's kind of, this is the speaking personally, but I'm always aware that if I really want to deepen that engagement with artists so that we can have an arc and not have it be product oriented and be engaged in the process, that means I'm saying no to many, many, many more people. And it means that as we're also trying to sort of kind of open up pathways for artists who have been underrepresented, underrepresented uh, that's also kind of reducing. So that is a stress and a strain I just want to kind of put on the table as we're thinking about finite amount of resources, whether that's cash, whether that's room in the theater, whether that's staff bandwidth, and yet the sort of goal to be more expansive. So I just want to kind of offer that question out as well. Thank you so much, Bill. I think what you just hit on is really, the, is really critical in my mind, which is the way I've been doing my work, both when I was at UNC, but also at Mellon, which is that um, it all boils down to human relationships and how much we care or how much we want to work on behalf of another. And the importance there is that it is the commitment to the relationship that trumps all and that we have to find ways to want to work on behalf of others. And this is why I'm so glad we have some creative producers here too. And I just noticed, um, sorry, what is your name? Ma Matthew. Matthew's here and Linda's here but, and, and Miranda's here. I wonder if you can all just join in now. We have only about 10 minutes left, so I just want us to be mindful of that. But um, please feel free to to ask your question or comment. Oh, hi everyone, my name is Miranda Wright. I'm at the Center for the Arts at Kayenta in Southwest Utah now, as of four months ago. I'm a white woman with dark brown hair, dark glasses, and a lumpy gray sweater. Um, Bill, a lot of what you just spoke about is what is kind of shaking me in the core right now too. And I was talking to Jennifer earlier about at my center, I'm charged with bringing in new ideas and starting to spark curiosity around ideas that the current audience doesn't, there's no demand, there's no demand. So if I'm going to follow this kind of pathway toward uh, business, I, during the pandemic I tried to become a capitalist. I went for an MBA, I got an MBA. I'm not a capitalist yet, like I can't figure it out. But um, what, you know, I think what we all know is that, is that capitalism or business practices are not going to solve all of the problems that we've been feeling for decades. What could help solve problems is capital and access to capital. And access to capital for artists, access to land. Capital doesn't need to mean money. So I'm just trying to think through 
this larger idea and this kind of momentum I'm starting to feel, feel from some of the conversation toward business practice and markets and you know, these business terms, but actually at the end of the day, we just need to leverage capital toward the same goals that we have. So this is what I'm, so I'm just, my, I guess my question I wanted to leave everyone with is as human beings, each of us probably have more access to capital than many people outside of this room. And what are we personally, as people who are in charge of institutional capital, willing to put on the table in a practice of generosity when we leave the room today? Thank you, Miranda. Kathy? Um, I, leading right from the notion of business practices and going back to Lindsay's question about what could the larger institutions be doing, two really quick comments. One, I think, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Matthew Covey. Uh, I'm the executive director of Thomas Dot. I am a white man. My pronouns are he, him. I've got a beard, a glasses, and a dark shirt. Um, I, I'm going to answer this question, question in my capacity in a, in a lawyerly fashion. And I think one thing that's really important, it goes back to what Rico was talking about in regards to how we formalize the relationships between presenters and, present and, and artists, um, which comes down, from my point of view, often to contracts. And I want to say that we can have a lot of great conversations about building community and building relationships, but then it goes to legal, and then it all falls apart. <laughs> but I want to say that as a lawyer in the room, it doesn't have to. That there are ways to, in other industries, we have lots of ways of contracting fuzzy stuff and building community into contracts. You can do it, it's just, takes work and it takes having your lawyers on your side. So the larger institutions where, whether it's a large institution that is really hidebound by its bureaucracy or if you're a large institution where you're a big presenter at that large institution and you have the power, if it's the latter, push through the bureaucratic changes that are needed to come up with better contracts that create better relationships because if you can do it, then they will spread. Those will become best practices throughout the industry. That's one thing. Other thing, unsurprisingly, uh, cultural exchange, cultural diplomacy, people have talked about visas. They're hard, but they're not impossible. And the big institutions need to take the responsibility to push through the hardest of the visas for the rest of us. That's what I had to say. Here, here. Thank you. Um, Claudia, Linda, you have. You want to take us home? How much time do we have left? Well, a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay, we're okay. Three minutes? Three minutes, okay. basically. My name is Claudia Norman. She hers, um, uh, immigrant from Mexico City, working in the performing arts. And uh, I just want to say that about the learnings about COVID on the international work, I think uh, I have the opportunity to work with two artists with no access to technology. Uh, no Zoom, uh, with uh, commissioning to uh, create a new work uh, in the middle of COVID. And I think, to me, uh, it's, it's like a deja vu going back 20 years, probably 25 years when I started, when I moved here and I started working here with no um, infrastructure, but creating a festival uh, commissioning a uh, new work and I think to me the different, the big point was what was the pur purpose of that commission? To premiere in the U.S. a wonderful work or really to support the artists in the rural community, therefore their families and really that, that commission have an impact, international impact, not only because it's a somebody from other region of the world, but because that infrastructure was able to support an entire community abroad. So I just want to um, leave um, like this as a thought that we've been able to present international work for a very long time. The challenges has been always the same. It's about policies, it's about politics, uh, but here we are, and I think to me is just um, I'm just really looking forward for the new generation 
of uh, uh, believers <laughs> uh, on uh, the importance of having international work, on uh, having uh, uh, the learnings that the human relationship with others brings into our lives. Finally, uh, I think presenting, commissioning, being an artist or independent producer, it's about sharing a human experience. And this is what we are doing after 36 months on Zoom with some of them. Finally, we are learning and just by two hours, three hours of human relationships. So I, we have to keep going. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Nothing, no, you could, please feel free. Well, I, I'm Linda Brumbach from Pomegranate Art. She, her, I'm wearing a green jumpsuit. I'm, I guess, upper middle age. Um, um, I, I just want a, a few reflections, and I'll cut it short from what I was going to say, but I thought it was just, in terms of our international platforms, really beautiful to see um, what was democratized over the last few years in this space for so many of us of we each had our own little box. It was the same size. We kind of got rid of the color-coded power structure of the many of the conferences of buyers and sellers and opened up a lot of doors, including the creative producer SEPA space that um, grew from 12 people in a room to almost 200 people now. Um, Michael, I, I'm very thrilled you brought up the um, 501c3 structure, I think we discovered maybe five people in that room were part of that structure, so a lot of them had been invisible through the back door. Um, and I'm, Samara, you know, just in terms of wherever, you, there you are, um, the depth and the value of an artist being um, in a space with an institutional partner through the process, um, I, I hope and I see expanding a little bit. I think the whole idea and the value of we have to have a world premiere we, we're gonna pay more for a world premiere, or exclusivity is just feels dwindling appropriately so away. Because the value of having not just the lead artist, but the expansive artist community in your community for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, I mean, the value of what happens to share that process with the entire community, the production team, the, the, the people holding the vision of the artist, is so valuable and I would encourage people just not only to give your space but and, and, and support your own staff institutionally, but the artists are valuable and the people in those communities need to be paid for that time during those pocket, those residencies. That is deeply valuable shift of, I think, what international exchange uh, means and can mean in our future. Thank you, Linda. Here you. Um, well, we've run out of time. Um, we are now at the end. I, um, I think I'm going to ask you for some grace because so much was discussed that is, I, I feel incapable of trying to summarize it all like, adequately. <laughs> and so if anyone else is able to do so afterwards, please let me know and I can get some notes from you all. I think what it comes down to for me um, is, the, the, is the capital that exists in human relationships. Uh, is to acknowledge that artists are the chroniclers of our humanity and that we should be celebrating them as such. And that we need to be thinking about capitalism, the marketplace, in ways that advance their, them as human beings, not to advance ourselves, um, and find opportunities for us to be able to access the capital that we already have. And I really do mean that in ways that are much more, much more um, expansive than, of course, dollars and cents. And I really love, Matthew, your contributions towards the end, just regarding reminding us that um, we accept things far more than we actually challenge them. And that we uh, want to make changes in such ways, and yet we don't actually acknowledge the, the limitations that we've actually put upon ourselves. And I'll just mention in closing, in the ways that we at the Mellon Foundation have been trying to make some of these changes, we are now making grants to LLCs. For, for so many people, that was anathema. Uh, it was something that they didn't know was even possible. And uh, as we've done this work at, at Mellon, I, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Isabel and Emily, over there in the corner, who've been doing all this heavy lifting for so long now, is that we are now in a situation where our legal counsel is not asking us um, why are we doing this, or they're not asking us how do we do this. They're asking us, give us another one. 
or what's the next one, and how do we figure this out? And now, there is actually a tremendous amount of capital at Mellon, for example, beyond the, we have a lot of dollars and cents, but we also have legal capital. We have a lot of other forms of, of support, and I really do believe the ecosystem also has a lot more untapped resources than we think we do have. And if we can just start in that acknowledgement and the values of each of our own human relationships with one another, I think we'll find both the, the inspiration to act the, and the knowledge and the opportunities to come forward. So um, thank you all. As was mentioned at the very beginning, this is not the conversation. This is a conversation. So uh, please do forgive us if we have not covered everything you believe we should have covered. Um, and I do want to acknowledge everyone in the room who joined us today, but especially those who braved the conversation circle. Thank you all very much for joining us. And um, before you all leave, though, I do want to, of course, turn it back over to the official hostess, uh, Jamie Galou. Thank you, Emil. Can we please give Emil a round of applause? So thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to just quickly, again, acknowledge some folks without whom this event would not be possible. Um, the IPC Steering Committee, Susan Feldman, and our host here at St. Anne's. The the support of the Barr Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and last but not least, of course, the whole HowlRound team. <laughs> and a big thank you to everyone who tuned in online. Please take care. And for those of you who are here in the room, we now invite you to continue the conversation here um, during a nice little reception with some beverage and nosh until 5.30. Thanks so much, everyone.